are usually three stages in constructing the argument or the discussion of the sermon. First of all, obviously, there's collecting the possible data. I've already told you I create a page for each main point. On each page, as I work through the exegesis, I'll write down ideas, research, cross-references, meanings of, of Greek or Hebrew words, you know, anything that, that I want to remember that I'm afraid I might not remember goes down on those sheets. You're only taking notes. That's, this is purely the research phase at this point. But you're grouping it so you don't have to say, okay, I wrote down a great, I wrote down a great cross-reference about this verse. Where is that in my notes? Instead, you want to make sure you intentionally are keeping it categorized so you can find it. So put it under that main point so that when you're putting together the, the body of that main point, it's easy to find. Second stage is creating a rough sketch or a rough draft of the sermon. At this stage, you're, creating, you're actually beginning to create your sermon. It's not just research. You're creating a document that shows the flow of thought. Think of it as a flow chart for what you eventually intend to say. It's not filled out. You haven't written everything out. It's just a sort of flow chart of, okay, I want to I wanna explain this word. I want to take them to this cross-reference. I want to use this illustration. So it's, it's a sort of flow chart that fills in. If you use a computer, this is when you would begin that stage. Is you would now, if you've, you may have started, even your research, you may have done that. Personally, I think that can get in the way because there are going to be things in your research you write down that you don't ultimately use in your sermon. So I, I don't think it's helpful to use your computer at the first stage, but I think at this stage, you begin then to put it in your computer. Now, there are a couple of ways to get it in your computer. Some of you are, are really quick typists. Go for it. Then there are the rest of us. And so, I mean, I, I can type reasonably fast, not like a pecker or anything, you know, once, one finger at a time. But I can talk a lot faster than I can type. And so I actually use, to, to get my notes that I've made now on each of those main points, to get that rough draft going in my computer, I use uh, Dragon Dictation in my Mac. I get, I, if you do that, get a good quality microphone. You know, you it, spend the extra money, get a good quality mic. I have, let's see here, I'll show you. Um, I think I have it with me. I have a USB mic. Yeah, it's, it's this little microphone here that sits up. It'll either attach to your to your computer or it'll sit on your desk. This is the Samson Go mic. It's, uh, it's well reviewed online. But the, the, a quality mic will make a big difference in how well the, the dictation software recognizes your voice. And so um, you might want to spend a little on that. I use it. I found that that little thing right there saves me somewhere between an hour and two hours a week because uh, I can speak it into my computer a lot faster than I can type. So between, particularly you're talking two sermons, you're saving a lot of time. So those are the kinds of things you want to be looking at saving time. I already told you about having a template, a Word doc template that you can pull up. Everything's already set. You can get to typing it in quickly so you're not having to reformat everything. And uh, this is another little way I found to trim a little time off my preparation. And once you get used to it, obviously you have to get up to speed with it, but once you do... Now, so far in the exegetical process, you've accumulated a lot of information, miscellaneous ideas, you've scribbled notes all over these sheets. As you're dictating your rough draft in, don't dictate everything you've written down. You have to be careful. In the process of building the body of the message, you sort through all that you've collected, including only the information that will enable the theme of the text, now your proposition, to produce the maximum effect. So just because you wrote it down on those research pages does not mean that it makes its way into the sermon. At this stage, you're asking yourself, does this really help? Does this really contribute to my people better understanding this passage in the way God intended it to be understood? So... I love the way John Stott puts it in his book, uh, Between Two Worlds. He says, we must be ruthless in discarding the irrelevant. Ruthless, that's a great word. 
This is easier said than done. During our hours of meditation, numerous blessed thoughts and scintillating ideas may have occurred to us and then been dutifully jotted down. It is tempting to drag them all in somehow. Resist the temptation. Obviously, when you wrote it on your note sheet, you wrote it because it struck you somehow. It seemed important to you. But that doesn't mean it's really important to understanding that text. So you're at this stage, you've got to really be ruthless. You've got to be asking yourself, does this really warrant being included in the sermon? Is it going to aid people's understanding of the passage? Or is this just something that, you know, tickled my own curiosity? The third stage is actually writing the message. This is refining the rough sketch that you've made, filling it out, going back through it, filling it out, writing it out more with more thorough explanation. And if you manuscript, complete sentences. Now, let me just make an argument for you guys. I would argue, and I do so not on my own basis alone, but on the authority of the church's greatest preachers of the past, the greatest homileticians of the past, that you should write out your sermons in near manuscript form even if you only take a speaking outline into the pulpit. In other words, write it out even if you're not going to take all of that into the pulpit. Why would you do that? By the way, Lloyd-Jones did that for many years. Why? Because as Francis Bacon said, writing makes an exact man. If you can write it down clearly where the flow of thought is captured, then it's clear in your own mind. Too often men get into the pulpit with sort of half-baked ideas and they aren't clear to their people because they aren't clear in their own thinking. They haven't really thought through the passage. As John Stott argues, the discipline of clear thinking demands writing. The discipline of clear thinking demands writing. Another value of writing it all out is that in the heat of the moment when you're preaching, if you've preached at all, you understand this. In in the heat of the moment in preaching, if all you have in your notes is explain the gospel here, if that's all you ever do, I do that sometimes. I'll put that in my notes. But if that's all you ever do, what happens as you explain the gospel? Yeah, it comes out the same way you've always said it. Whereas in your study, when you're working on this, when you're, when you're working through this, you can say to yourself, I don't want to say this exactly the way I've always said it. How can I put this differently? But it's much harder to do that on the fly in preaching. So there's, there's benefit there as well. All right, let me show you kind of what this might look like. Here is... Here for, um, this is actually more filled out than I would suggest your first draft would be. This is more like, this is more like, uh, or or your second draft rather, um, your rough sketch. This is more filled out than your rough sketch should be, but I just put it up there to show you that even once I did that, I printed it out and I started saying, okay, I don't like that, that doesn't help, I'm going to cut that, I'm going to change that word, I'm going to scratch that, yeah, that's no good. That's what that little squiggly line means where I bracket something and squiggly. That's an editor's mark for cut this, take this out. So you're always looking at, okay, I don't like that. That's not working. That passage doesn't do what I thought it did when I looked at it a little more. So you're, you're always editing. Here's, here's a second draft. This was from, um, let's see, were both of these? Yeah, this is actually from the message I preached at Shepherd's Conference when I was I knew I was going to be teaching a course like this, and so I sort of captured each stage. So here's here's kind of 2A, stage 2A in the writing of that sermon, and then here's here's the getting farther along, another draft where I'm I'm still taking things out, I'm still editing, I'm revising. And so this, is, this just goes on constantly. I do a lot of this on computer, not like this, not where I print it out and hard copy it, but you can't, I can't show you that. So when I was going through this, I, I did it hard copy just so it could be illustrated. Kind of I'm always going back through and that doesn't work and that doesn't work and let's add this and so forth. 
All right. Now, let me encourage you, when you look at the body of your sermons, to evaluate how well you're doing on balance. Make a copy of your notes from a recent sermon. This is really helpful. Make a copy from your notes of a recent sermon, and then take four color highlighters and assign a color to each of the four elements that should make up the body of your sermon. Explanation, argumentation, illustration, and application. And then go through your notes and mark in the margin which is which. When you highlight those different elements with the different colors, what you will find is that three of those should be included somewhat balanced under each point. There should be explanation, there should be illustration, there should be application. And when appropriate, argumentation. Probably maybe once per message, there's some argumentation. I can almost guarantee you if you'll do that exercise, you'll find that you're struggling maybe with not having enough of one or the other. You may be an explanation guy, and you've got like pages of explanation, and you've got one little illustration. Or you may be, you know, uh, an application guy. So you've got like two lines of explanation, and then you've got a page of application. This exercise is very helpful. Here's, here's what I did with mine as I was going through just checking the balance, just saying, okay, let's see what's what here, really. That's a very, that's a really helpful exercise to see if, if you're in balance in terms of what ought to be in your messages. Okay? Yes, sir. Getting to end, or do you start with the outline, give a point or two under each, and then go back and keep filling in in more and more detail as you go through? Yeah, it really is what fits you. Personally, I put the outline points. I usually start with the, the theme or proposition, the outline points, and the, per, the passages it's covering. And then I come back in and fill in each main outline point fairly thoroughly before I move to the next outline point because I'm dictating. So that's just a more natural flow for me because I'm pulling. So let's say here's how it works. I'm, I'm in front of my computer. I've got all my note sheets from collecting the data. I begin my dictation. I dictate, okay, introduction. I want to, I want to introduce it by doing this. And I just give a brief line. I want to do this. Then comes the, the passage. I want to read the passage. I want to give my propositional package. Then I have my main outline point one. I'm going to start with explanation. So in my notes, what I always do is put the verse spelled out first, then the explanation, and then, of course, illustration, application from there. I'll show you, I'll show you a sample in just a minute. We'll look at several samples. So... That's really up to you, what works for you. All right, let's move to the next category, creating a logical flow. You've now written your proposition. You have your outline. You have put together the body of the message. You want to link those major parts of the message together and provide a roadmap for people so that they know when you're moving from one point to the next. That's what I mean by creating a logical flow between your main points. Nothing will more quickly obscure the structure of your message to those you're preaching to than failure to give them clear logical flow from one point to the next. It may be clear in your notes, but if you don't create the opportunity to make that clear to them, they're not going to track with you. This is one of the biggest mistakes beginning preachers make. They've got their outline points, they've got their explanation, but they give no thought to how to transition their listeners from one main point to the next main point. What happens is the listener becomes muddied and, is he still talking about that or did, did we move on? And it becomes very difficult to follow. The tool that best ensures this kind of clarity is the transition statement. John Broadus writes this, transition may be formally defined as both the act and means of moving from one part of the sermon to another, from one division to another, and from one idea to another. 
Transitions are to sermons what joints are to the bones of the body. They are the bridges of the discourse, and by them the preacher moves from point to point. Now, what are the purposes of such a transition? First of all, emphasis. If you do your transitions right, it really emphasizes the main points of the message, the main outline points of the message. In addition, movement. It enables the audience to recognize that you're leaving one major outline point and you're moving to the next one. A third purpose of the transition is logic. It identifies for your audience the logical connection between the two major points, the one you're leaving, the one you're coming to. And then finally, introduction, it introduces the next main division. What are the components then of a transition? What what needs to be there for this to be done well? First of all, there needs to be a brief review statement of the previous point. Now, if there are, let's say you're preaching a sermon with five points, five main outline points, somewhere in your transitions, one of your transition statements, you probably should review the ones that have come so far, just to make sure people are clear with where you're going. Let's say before you do number four, you say, well, so far we have learned one, two, three. And now we see a fourth, back to your key word, argument, reason, principle, whatever it is. You see what you've done is, you're helping them track with you. You're giving them that roadmap. It's like you've given them Google Maps, and they're with you now. So a brief review statement. Secondly, and I'm going to give you some examples here, so, so just let me give these to you, and then we'll go back and we'll look at some examples. A transition word, for example, words like but or however or in addition or secondly or finally, some transition word that says we're leaving one point and going to the next. A a question or a statement regarding the next point that helps draw the listener to the next point. And this is really important. The key plural noun repeated. Why is that important? You see how that proposition statement shapes your whole message. If you have five principles of, or I think there were four principles, of, of passing the, the, the truth of Christianity, the doctrine of Christianity, onto the next generation. You told them in the beginning, I'm going to give you four principles, or I'm going to give you principles. Maybe you didn't say four. I'm going to give you principles. That's what this text is doing. And then when you introduce point number three, you say, here is another principle, or here's a third principle, or you see what I'm saying? You, They're with you. They know exactly where you've been. They know where you're going. So that key plural noun helps them track with you and know where where you are. Let me give you an example. Again, I I go back to, since I've given you several examples from 1 Corinthians 3, that message I did here at Shepherd's Conference. Here was one of my transitions. There's one last, okay, now first of all, Do you see the transition word? Last. There's one last instruction. What's that? There's my key word. Because all of the things, all of my major outline points were instructions. Paul gives us instructions for how to build in a way that we're supposed to build a church. So I have last. Now they know, okay, I'm, we're leaving the previous point, we're going to another point, and it's going to be the last one. Instruction, there's my plural noun, and singularly, obviously, because we're talking about one of them. And uh, there's one last instruction Paul gives to us as the leaders of his church. Now, here I'm going to choose to review, to make sure if they missed one of my points, because you know, sometimes your, your listeners skip in and out. I hate to tell you that. You do that. You're listening to a sermon, and it's like, oh, what was the second point? Uh, you know, I, I, I went somewhere, my, my phone buzzed in my pocket, and I'm wondering who's texting me or, you know, whatever. And so 
not only, number one, build on the right foundation and not only use the right materials, there's the review, but also, there's another transition word, and then on to announcing your final point. You see how that works? It's really, really helpful for your listeners to actually write this in your notes If, if I won't take you through Romans because you get the idea, but in my Romans messages, I'm always doing this. You're always looking at carrying your listeners along with you, giving them a roadmap by the transitions you use between your major points. And you don't always say it the same way. You'll notice I've tried, to, I've tried not to say a third instruction. Now, sometimes I will. There's nothing wrong with that, but don't always do it the same way. Try to vary it, but include those elements so that they know what's happening. The logistics, uh, let's see, that's moving on. The logistics of the transition, I would encourage you to write them out. Actually write them in your notes. Essentially read them, because every one of those words is important. So, you know, when you're doing your transition, walk through it with them. And then stress it in a way that it stands out from the rest of the message. How do you stress something verbally? Well, maybe you come to the end of the second point, you pause just one second. And then you say, there's one last instruction. You see how that emphasis tells them, okay, we've broken from the previous point and we're going to another one. So you stress it in such a way that it stands out from the rest of the message. Questions about transitions. It's an important element, but I don't think we need to beat it up anymore. Okay, introductions and conclusions. Adding an introduction and conclusion. The introduction is really designed to accomplish one of three things, or possibly several of them. First of all, to secure your listeners' interests. You obviously want to avoid sensationalism, but part of the purpose of an, in, of an introduction is to get them with you, is to let them see this is important. This is important because of the theme. It's important because of its connection to them. It's important because of what's going on in the world at large, whatever, somehow to secure their interests. Secondly, to create a need, not a, not a felt need. That's what we're talking about. I'm talking about the kind of need that says, why should I listen to this message? had a busy week. I'm kind of tired. Maybe I went to bed late last night. Why should I really engage in this message? Thirdly, to introduce, and this is obviously the most important, to introduce the theme of the message. It introduces the theme of the passage and the body of the sermon. You sort of have a narrowing focus. You might start in your introduction kind of large where they wonder, you know, where is he ultimately going with this? And you're bringing them down until you get to the end of your introduction. You brought them to introduce the actual theme of the message. If you're preaching a series, let's say you're preaching several sermons on the same paragraph, then the intro should also connect them with the previous messages, with the, with the context, so they know where you are in the flow of that paragraph. I always have introduction, read the passage, review, or some variation of that. The introduction ends with the proposition and the transition sentence. As I told you, that's always near the end of the introduction because you're going to go right from that, that propositional package, which has your plural noun, to the first of those in your first outline point. So it makes sense for them to be close together in proximity. In most cases, it's best to write it out. Write out your introduction. Don't just say, I'm going to tell this story. Because you're not going to be very, you're not going to really grab their attention. You're not going to be very focused. Write it out so you know where you want to go with it. Now, if you want a list of possible kinds of introductions, I'm not going to do that this morning. You can get those from uh, Rediscovering Expository Preaching. There's a, there's a list of the kinds of introductions that you can use. 
when you're looking at your message. This is not where most people struggle as much. A lot of pastors put a lot of, a lot of emphasis and energy into their introductions, uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But questions? Conclusions. Preachers rarely neglect an introduction. If you look at most guys' notes, they have introduction ideas, but they often fail to prepare a conclusion. A carefully crafted conclusion allows the sermon to come to an appropriate ending rather than an abrupt stop. Have you heard somebody who doesn't have a prepared conclusion? And they've really worked through the passage, they've kept you with them, and they get to the end and it's like, I don't know what to say now. (laughs) And it's awkward. You want to give as much thought to how you're going to end the message as you do to how you're going to begin the message and what you're going to say under each point. Now, it should be, um, this goes in some ways without saying, but the conclusion should be a natural sort of termination to the message in both style and in content. Let me give you an example. I actually heard something like this. If your whole message is is about something eminently serious, you're preaching a message on hell, then your conclusion should probably not be light and frivolous. That's my point. There there is an appropriateness. The, the, The conclusion of the message should reflect the overall tone of of style and content of the message. Now, what are your objectives in the conclusion? What are the purposes for a conclusion? Number one, you want to review the passage. You want to review the theme of the text and or the main divisions. You're summarizing the message in the conclusion. I don't mean you're retelling everything you've said. Instead, you're just giving them the big picture of what this message was about again. Secondly, you're applying the truth. You're aiming at the will of the listener. You're making it personal. It should compel the hearer to respond in an appropriate manner to the message. The conclusion, again, answers the question, so what? Now, as far as just some other miscellaneous considerations when you think about the conclusion, again, like the introduction, I would encourage you to write it out, as you saw that I did with both my introductions and conclusions. It should not be announced. Don't say, in conclusion, why should you never say that? When you hear somebody do that, you hear the packing up of the Bibles, the putting away of the notepads, and they're missing everything you're saying. So just conclude. Don't tell them you're going to conclude. Also, And this is another reason is often it's a breach of your integrity because a lot of pastors say in conclusion when they still have like 15 minutes of stuff to say. Everybody's sitting there expectantly thinking, oh good, we're going to beat the restaurant crowd to, to, you know, the area restaurants and you go on 15 minutes. So it's not helpful. Don't announce it. No new material, no new explanation, new exegesis. That shouldn't go in your conclusion. And often, if not always, there should be some appeal to unbelievers to repent. Okay? Some forms of conclusions could be an illustration. Don't overdo, again, variety is key. Don't overdo anything. An illustration, a question, could be a quotation that brings the the truth to bear specific instructions like we talked about ways and means that list of practical steps might be a hymn if it's a if it's a great truth about god maybe there's a hymn that sort of brings that all together could be repeating some portion of the text itself it's not uncommon for me to end a message by sort of in a sober way repeating a portion of the passage that we've studied together and letting that sort of rest on us all as I end the message. Just the weight of the scripture itself. So there are a lot of different ways you can, you can bring the message to a close. 
Questions about conclusions. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. When you get to be a pastor, your people are going to get to know you. They're going to know. They're going to have a feel for when you're ending. It's not that they know you're getting close to the end. It's, it's something about those words. You know, in conclusion, or now let me conclude. That kind of says it's time to pack up. I don't understand it, but it happens that way. So when I say to my congregation, let's think about some of the implications of this passage. They know, because I do that not every week, but often enough, they know, okay, the message is coming into a conclusion. But they also know that hopefully that's when they're going to get some really practical ways to carry this out so they're still with me. It's, I, I don't understand it exactly, but there's something about that expression itself. I've seen it. You've been at preachers, you know, like preachers' conferences, and somebody will say that, and all the preachers are folding up their, you know, even though they hate it with their own congregations. So, avoid it. All right, formatting your notes. By the way, this is a copy of one of John MacArthur's note pages. Uh, we'll talk, I'll show you another one, and we'll look at some of the things that you can learn from different preachers' notes. Because while you may not do them the way he does them, there are things he does in his notes that you ought to do in your notes. So we're going to look at some examples. But the format of the notes you take into the pulpit will depend, obviously, on your own personal preferences. Here are some of the issues you, can, you should consider, though, as you make that decision. First of all, form. Should they be handwritten? Or should they be computer generated? Those are the two basic issues. A couple of you have already told me you really prefer to take handwritten notes in the pulpit. Great. If that works for you, do that. It's obviously worked pretty well for John. I would suggest you consider computer generated, computer generated notes for several reasons. There are numerous advantages to preparing and archiving your messages on computer. <coughs> First of all, for some of us, they're more readable. You know, your handwriting is more like a physician than a pastor, and it may not be. You're, you're looking at your own notes while you're preaching. <laughs> what, what did I mean by that? Um, they're searchable. That's a great benefit, guys. I, I will often search my notes for when I dealt with a particular topic, but when you've preached, as I now have about a almost a thousand sermons in my church, 900 or something. I don't remember what sermon that was in. I just remember I dealt with it. So I can go up to my little all search button here on my MacBook and boom, I've got, there it is. You can't do that with handwritten notes. Also, they're easily edited. You can, you know, format them. You can edit the content a lot easier in typewritten form. You can easily block and copy a paragraph to another message. If I've dealt really thoroughly with an issue, let's say, explaining the glory of God, what is, the, what is kavod? I don't need to redo that from scratch in this message when I come to that concept again. I can find that, go back, block and copy a small section of that, and read it into my notes. And I may tweak it or change it or whatever, but I didn't have to write it from scratch. So that's the beauty of having um, computer-generated notes. It's also transportable. When you are a pastor and if you're asked to speak in other places, it's really handy to have every sermon you've ever written with you. Really handy. So it, you, and you don't always take your computer. You're not always in a, in a situation where you have your computer, even if it's back at the hotel. So to have access on your electronic devices to all your sermons is really helpful. Also, they're easily archived and preserved. If you don't hear anything else I say in this section, listen to this. Your most valuable asset as a preacher are all those notes you've produced. Think about that. I have spent 30 hours a week for 12 and a half years. What happens if I lose my notes? You know, all my hard copy notes are stored at my church office. 
as you saw the other day on the news, we do have tornadoes that come through Texas. What happens if a tornado destroys my church building? And that's all I have. 30 hours a week for 12 and a half years, gone. Because I'm not going to remember all that. So I would strongly encourage you to make sure that you archive them. What I do, there are several ways I do that, and I'm almost paranoid on this front. I have a copy, the hard copies at my office at the church. I have a number of file cabinet, file drawers that are filled with my notes. In addition, I have them on my laptop, which is wherever I am, and I've had the computer guys at my church create an online cloud backup so that immediately within the day's time, any message I've worked on, any file I've worked on is stored off-site. Why is that important? Because the same tornado could get my house and my church. They're not that far apart. Seriously. I mean, think about it. Would you want to lose every message you've worked on for 12 years? No. So take precautions. Think, how can I really preserve this and protect this? Because that's your most valuable possession. Next year, wife and kids, of course. But you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I need to say that in case this is published or something. <laughs> so uh, store copies at at least two or more locations. And if you live in California, where you have major earthquakes and fires that break out as a result and, and wildfires. I mean, when I lived here, we had a, one of those huge, you know, 50-foot wall of flame come within a half mile of my house. That's a clarifying moment when the police officer comes to your door and says, you have 10 minutes to get out, take whatever you want, but know that nothing may be here when you get back. What do you take? Kids, yeah. <laughs> Good choice. But you probably should add wife to that list too. But seriously, okay, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm being a little bit uh, dramatic on that, but I'm telling you guys, it is a huge issue. So that is one benefit to make sure that you use computer-generated stuff. And if you don't, if you handwrite them, at least, you know, you get a, I have a PDF scan program on my iPad, scan them and send them somewhere into the cloud world somewhere where they're not with you and they're preserved if something happens to your church or to your home. Style. And here we're talking about do you take, for example, a manuscript? And when we talk about a manuscript, there's, of course, the full manuscript where you've written out every word, and then there is a, a sort of detailed outline. This is what I prefer. Now, if you look at my notes, you'll see in places it sort of looks like a full manuscript, as you saw. And then I don't write out everything I intend to say about every cross-reference or every passage I'm going to take them to. And so it's kind of a blended thing for me. Um, I think the more detailed it is, the more powerful language you can include because you're in your study, you're able to think about how you want to say that, and it, it's different, it's fresh. There's a freshness that comes with that. I also think there's another huge benefit to writing out more of your sermon, whatever you take into the pulpit. Can you think of what that might be? In addition to exactness and thinking it through, there's another practical benefit. Hmm? Variety. Variety, that's one. There you go. Think about this. You spend 30 hours, or for a given message, let's say 17 hours, you spend studying for that message. And your head is full of that. You have a detailed outline, but it's three pages. Two years go by. One of the churches in your community asks you to come and preach for them, and on that theme or that passage, you pull out your three pages of outline. A lot of what you learned in the study is gone. There's no way to reproduce it except studying it again. Whereas the fuller that content is, the, more, the, the easier it is to pull those notes out, review them, review the passage, pray through it, think through it, and boom, you're ready to go. Because it's all there. Everything that you thought was important to the explanation of that passage is in your notes. This is 
I, I just tell you practically, guys, as a preacher, this is huge. Even if I only took three, you know, a note card with three points into my pulpit, I would write out my notes because I don't want to lose all that. It's back to, you know, a tornado taking all my notes away. In a sense, that's what happens if I don't write out all my study. It's gone. So I would really, really urge you to consider this. Now, what I do with a detail outline, I'll show you my notes in a minute. Uh, well, you've seen some of them already, but, but um, I, I do bullets. I have main points, and then I do bullets. The reason for that is because it allows me to capture single ideas when I glance down. If you do full paragraphs, it's really easy to glance, it's really hard, I should say, to glance down and sort of capture the next idea. You've got to sort of be looking and, and now, okay, now I got it, and I look back up. And it, it keeps you too tied to your notes. I still have to use my notes a lot because I'm preaching three services. And if I don't stick with my notes, it's really easy to repeat myself in the same service or to leave something out in another service. And so I have to stay fairly close to my notes. But by doing it by bullet points, it separates ideas. So I can glance down, capture an idea, look up, and I haven't, I'm not reading my notes. So that's why I do it that way. And then I indent bullet points under bullet points to show what's subordinate. So when I look down, I know the main idea, just like we did with our block diagram, I know the main idea is farther left, and the supporting <laughs> ideas are indented under it. So it's just a visual display that when I look down, it's obvious, and I don't have to think about it. I don't have to wonder, okay, what's what? In fact, let me just show you. Let me. All right, now you see, this is what I'm teaching you right now. Notice the notice the I, my main outline point is obvious formatting your notes and then i've i've gotten out to the left hand margin form and style so that it's clear when i glance down those are the main points that i want to touch on and then what's supporting that is indented i have a i have a map on this page when i just glance down of what's important what needs to stand out what i need to emphasize Whereas if this were in more of a paragraph form or everything were to the left-hand margin, it, I'd have to be looking a lot more at my notes. Those are just practical things that I've learned over time help me so that I don't have to be as visually tied to my notes. So you need to, I would encourage you to consider uh, a detailed outline at the very least. Some take just a simple speaking outline, just sort of a... Uh, Five points, a couple of sub points, an illustration, you know, illustration here sort of notes. If that's what you want to take into the pulpit, that's fine. Again, though, I would strongly urge you to write out your notes in detail for the reasons we've already talked about. Some preach extemporaneously, that is, not without preparation, but without notes to follow. There's even a book, you've probably seen it or maybe read it, called Expository Preaching Without Notes. They sort of take it as this is God's own way. I disagree with that, but, but it is a way, and some people do that. They feel like there's more freedom. For me, there's a whole lot more freedom knowing what I've really studied and prepared, having it there in front of me. Don't, not being tied to it in the sense of, of having to read it, but in the sense of knowing that if my mind slips a gear, it's right there. And if I didn't sleep well that Saturday night, it's even more important. Or I'll give you an illustration when it became very important for me. Um, I was thinking of this just this week when it was raining. I was driving up the 5 freeway north to Santa Clarita, which is where I lived for 16 years. And, and right at the 210, you know where the 210 joins the 5 coming south? There was a car spun out sitting in the median. And traffic was backed up. The police was there. It just brought back this, this really vivid memory for me. Because there was a Sunday morning when John was away, and he'd asked me to preach here at Grace all day. And so my wife was nine months pregnant. In fact, we were taken to the hospital that next week. My daughter had pneumonia or something. You know how it is. It all comes together. And, and so I was, uh, I was alone coming down to preach on the five freeway. It was raining. There, were like, there was no other car anywhere around. And I was in the, not the, the lane close to the median, but the, the second lane over, driving at a reasonable speed. I think I was doing 55, 60. It wasn't like I was being reckless. And it wasn't really raining a lot. It was just sort of that misty stuff that falls sometimes. 
And all of a sudden, I feel the back end of the car start fishtailing on me. Not turning, not braking, nothing. And it, it, the very same spot where this car was, was, uh, had spun out the other day. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I tried to turn into it like they teach you to do that, but the back end just came around on me. And I did two 360s down the center median, totaled the car, and came to rest facing the opposing traffic in the gap between the wall and, you know, that little bit of divider there. And, and I'm sitting there trying to get my, my frame of reference again, and these cars are coming past me at like 70 miles an hour, 12 inches from my bumper. And I know I just turned, you know, I just spun out there. I'm thinking... Lord, here I come. This, this is it. <laughs> and, and then I realized, oh, wait a minute. I'm preaching at Grace in a few minutes. And I looked back, and my rear window had broken out, and my jacket had safety glass all over it. So, you know, I pulled it up. And, and then I realized my trunk was open, and my notes and all my stuff was back there getting wet. And so I waited for a break in the traffic that was long enough where I felt like it was safe. And I quickly unbuckled and I jumped out and I went and grabbed my briefcase and came through it, threw it in the front seat and rebuckled and called the police. And they didn't, they didn't get there for forever. But I called. I, so I start thinking at this point, all right, what am I going to do? I think I'm okay. I think I'm in my right mind. Um, so I called Phil Johnson, who I knew came down that way. And I said, Phil, look, you got to pick me up, take me to church. I'm supposed to preach. And I said, you better throw a message in your Bible just in case. I'm not as coherent as I think I am. And so he came by and eventually the police came. We got, the car was totaled and, you know, he, Phil picked me up. I got here five minutes before I'm supposed to step into the pulpit to greet everyone at 830. You know, I took a couple Advil, shook the safety glass out of my coat, and here I go, preaching Deuteronomy 6, morning and evening. And, um, and that was one occasion. I, I tell you that story to say that was one occasion I was so grateful to have thorough notes because I don't think I could have recalled everything I, I had studied and intended to say if I hadn't, didn't have it recorded before me. So that's why I would encourage you to do that. All right. I mean, not because you're going to have a wreck, but because you're, you're not always going to be fresh and you're not always going to be able to recall as well as you'd like. Paper size. Three basic choices preachers usually make. How many, just out of curiosity, how many of you use eight and a half by 11 to preach from? Okay. How many of you use like a six by nine sort of Bible size, like the paper they sell here in the bookstore? Okay. How many of you use five by eight, sort of a half sheet? Okay. Those are the three common sizes. Um, and you just have to decide what works best for you. Let me give you a couple of reasons to consider moving from eight and a half by 11 if you preach from an eight and a half by 11. It's the same thing I was talking about earlier. The wider the, the text on a sheet, the more difficult it is for you to look down and capture that entire line in your mind. It's just like in reading. You can read a lot quicker through a novel with a, with a thin uh, a, a, a thin series of texts because your eye can go to each line and skip to the next line. Whereas if it's a longer line, you have to do this. Same thing is true with your notes. And so it's, it's a lot easier to capture that shorter line in your line of vision when you glance down than it is to capture a long line. So you might try it, see how it works for a message or two. Uh, again, whatever works for you, it's not like set in stone, something you have to do. Highlighting and underlining. Whatever size you use and however detailed it is, you're going to want to highlight and mark your notes. And you create your own key so that at a glance, you can quickly identify certain things in your notes. Here's what you're going to want to identify. You're going to want to identify the main points. In my case, you saw I made them larger and in bold typeface, so they sort of stand out at me. Somehow, you're going to have to do that. Key words, key points. You saw, even here, you see, and I'll show you another copy of John's notes, but he writes next to a section of his notes, key. He wants to make sure not to miss that. You're going to want to do that in your notes as well. Mark verses that you're going to refer to, and I would suggest you have a different way to mark verses in your notes that you want them to turn to. What I do is underline the ones I want them to turn with me to. You may have even seen that in some of my PowerPoint slides. Some of the verses are underlined. That's a reminder to me that I want you to turn to that verse, usually. So 
work out a key in your own mind for how you're going to mark these things. Um, authors you quote or borrow from, you may want to use. Let me give you some samples, and then we'll take a break. Um, here is, here's John MacArthur. These are his notes. And again, you don't need to be able to read it. I'm not sure he can read it. But, <laughs> but, but what I want you to see is, is some things that he does. First of all, notice he, he uses black to write his notes, but then he uses a red highlighter to mark certain things for him. And you'll notice a couple of things he does. He uses that arrow. See the one up at the left? Let's see if I can. Yeah, there we go. You can see right here, he uses this arrow to mark something that he wants to stress. When it's really important, and he does this in all his notes, I've seen a lot of his notes, he, he sort of does this, uh, this red thing with the marker here and then writes key out in the left-hand margin. That tells him, whatever you do on this page when you're preaching, don't miss this. You really wanted to make sure you got this in. He will, he'll circle things. That, that, he, that are really stressed or underline them. And he has his own code for what that means. And that's what you want to do as well. You want to have your own code so that when you glance down, just as when he glances at these notes, you not only see the text, but you've somehow marked the things that you want to really emphasize. Here are Steve Lawson's notes. I have no idea how Steve Lawson <laughs> preaches from this. But these are his notes. But notice, he does, there is an order. There is a methodology. Notice at the top, you have a Roman numeral. So he's devoted a sheet to this Roman numeral. The invitation he issued. And next to it, he's written the verses that covers. I, I do the same thing because I think that helps me keep my thought together. And I think it'll help you. Um, then he puts up here, you'll see, he actually cut cuts and paste. This is his anti-computer age uh, statement, sort of his rant. There's the verse that he's cut and pasted that he's commenting on. And then you'll notice he's underlined the word follow me, the words follow me, and then here's his explanation over here to what that is. Uh, I think this is to give them context. Best I can figure, this paragraph up here is about context. But, but my point is not that you're going to do it this way. I doubt you are. But, but Steve has created his own key to do the very same things that you saw in John MacArthur's notes. You'll see he's got arrows, things he really wants to emphasize down here, these big, these big arrows. He's highlighted other words so that they jump out at him from the, the flow of the rest of his notes. Um, and he's boxed things. Again, to him, that helps him discern what's going on in each portion of his notes. Let's look at John Piper's notes. He manuscripts entirely. You can see it's even in paragraph form. Um, but he does the same thing. Notice he has this, this sort of code that, that he's developed. Notice how he puts boxes around the reference. He does that consistently throughout this page. He also writes key words in the left-hand margin that sort of summarize that paragraph for him. Moralistic, religious, no fear. Then he uses his circles, you know, where he circles words, not boxes them, but circles them as some sort of point of emphasis. I'm not exactly sure all that he has in mind there, underlines certain other things. And then he draws these lines linking ideas to show that these are tied together. The point I want you to get is in all these examples, these men are, are marking the same kinds of things. They're just choosing to do it differently. That's what you need to do. You need to be able to glance down at your notes and the key ideas for you jump out. You need to have your own key that you've created. Now, uh, here, Adrian Rogers with the Lord, but before he died, obviously, I invited, uh, I asked him for a copy of his notes. He used a more, well, you know, he's more Arminian than I. He's a brother in Christ, and I appreciate him. Um, he preached, by the way, a, a 
one of the best messages I ever heard. When I was in, in Grace to You, we, I had to go to NRB, the National Religious Broadcasters, every year. And, you know, it was everything from soup to nuts and uh, <laughs> literally nuts. And, um, and often the messages were less than stellar. But he preached a great message one year calling everyone back to the Scripture. You know, the Micaiah only said, what the Lord say, said, that will I speak. And it was, it was just what NRB needed to hear. But so I went up and, and thanked him for his message. But anyway, uh, this is what he took into the pulpit. You can see this is more of a, a brief outline. He has his introduction, and then down about three quarters of the page, he has his first Roman numeral. He has points. He has scripture references, but he's not, he's not fleshing that out. He's not filling out what he intended to say. That's another approach some take. Took, take rather. And I think this was the computer version. I suspect what he took into the pulpit was marked as well. This version I got wasn't, but, but um, there's that. This is not that I'm in any of those categories, but just to show you what kind of how I do with my own notes. Um, first of all, you'll notice I, I highlight main words that for me stand out. My Roman numeral, you can see, is in a different font, and the reference is right after it, so I know what, what verses that Roman numeral covers. In addition, right after, right after the Roman numeral is I put the verse. Here's the verse, highlighted the verse number, and then the text of the verse. I have it in my Bible, so why would I put the text in my notes as well? Because I can keep moving more quickly this way. I can keep through the flow of the text than having to look back and forth and reorient myself. Also, uh, you'll notice the indentation I talked about. I even, in this message, this was again back to the one I preached at Shepherd's Conference because it's very hard to gauge how long you're going to go. You know this. And you have a time slot. So toward the end of my message, there was something, there was a quote by Carson I wanted to share, but I figured, you know what, it's not essential. So if, if I have a problem, I'm running short on time, I'm going to mark a time cut. What that actually says is... Um, Time cut if less than 10 minutes left to finish. So in other words, I don't have to think about it. When I get there, I glance down at my watch, and if, if I'm running short on time, I just jump over that and move on. There are times you'll want to do that as well. I still do that occasionally in my own church because if you're going to several different references, it's really hard to gauge how long you're going to spend in those places, and that can make your message go long. So I'll mark something near the end you know, time cut, and it, it goes in the trash if, I, if I'm going long. Also, one other thing to note here, you see this little arrow right here and the little statement there? What do you think that is? That's my transition. That's my format for a transition. When I come to that in my notes, I know there's my transition. This one says, well, it's the one I gave you earlier. There's one last instruction Paul gives to us as the leaders of the church. Not only build on the right foundation and use the best materials, but also remember the rightful owner. They knew I was leaving point two, going to point three. That red box, that was just for here. That was just for, so when I was looking through my notes, I could get to what I was going to illustrate for you men. I don't norm, or, ordinarily use a, a big box around my text. Oh, on the side. That's for PowerPoint, because I'm teaching here from PowerPoint. How do I know when to advance to the next slide? I have two keys in the left-hand margin for, for PowerPoint. And I don't preach from PowerPoint, although they wanted my sermon notes Sunday morning uh, so the kids could easily take notes and so forth to go in the bulletin. I said, that's not happening. You know, I'm not going to be done that, that, you know, I'm always tweaking. And so... Uh, they put them up in PowerPoint, just the main points behind me as I'm preaching. I don't do, deal with it at all. But, but if I'm teaching as I am here today and in this class from PowerPoint, then I just put, I just put out in the margin a big double box that says that's an, a new slide. And then the little box says that's the next, the next point on the slide. So it's just a key for me to know you know, so I don't get lost as I'm, most of the time anyway, as I'm teaching. So when I was uh, just starting preaching, I would do that on occasion. 
And it's, it's okay, particularly when we get to delivery. There's some things you can learn in delivery. Uh, kind of capture what you're doing, some odd things maybe you're doing, or just intensity, etc. But by and large, I don't think it's helpful to go in and practice. I think we'll talk about delivery in a few, just a few minutes, and I think there are other things to emphasize rather than practice. No, what you're seeing here is my, is my manuscript. It's, I don't fully manuscript. I'm somewhere between a full manuscript and a, and a, a detail outline. I'm, I kind of go back and forth depending on what I'm doing in that section. So, for example, I, some of what I shared with you in the conclusions that I shared, the application, that's pretty much how I would del have delivered it. That's almost word for word how I would have delivered it. On the other hand, there may be sections where I'm going to several passages outside of the preaching text, and I don't have anything jotted down there. I've just gone through those passages before in my study, and I know basically what I want to say. And so I'm just going to capture the flow of that. So I'm, I'm kind of a hybrid in a sense. 